Welcome to the Kraken Backs Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Johnny Bowden, a pioneer in functional nutrition who transformed his life and now challenges conventional health wisdom. We'll explore the effectiveness of genetic testing, question the necessity of statins, and unravel the myths about cholesterol. Dr. Bowden will also share his top diet strategies for vibrant aging and optimizing athletic performance in the youth. Plus, we'll discuss the impact of ancestry on diet, the benefits of quercetin for heart health, and how to truly enjoy a farm-to-table lifestyle. Get ready for a deep dive into transforming health perspectives with Dr. Bowden. Hey, Dr. Johnny Bowden, we got on the air today. It's great to have you. Uh, how are you doing out there? And uh, are, are you really in California? I'm really sorry to hear I'm that. I'm really in uh, Southern California. Yeah, last time. Right. <laughs> it's way much from us. It's beautiful. It's sunny right now. <laughs> uh, What's well, not the light, well, right? Right. Well, it's, it's sunny <laughs> here, too. <laughs> I'm not jealous. Anyway. Uh, a, 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 little more, a little more humidity. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Anyway. Hey, well, Dr. Bowden, it's great to have you on. I, I understand you've uh, grown quite the following. And your passion seems to grow every year for what you do. Let's let's go back to the very beginning and and understand what started this passion as a child. And, and we want to know more about nutrition and fitness from you. Uh, well, it certainly didn't start when I was a child. I was I had a previous career. I was a musician. Um, and a professional musician in New York City. Uh, and I grew up kind of in sex, drugs, and rock and roll era, Woodstock, all of that. And in my years as a musician, I lived exactly the way you would think a New York musician would live. So I did every <laughs> drug that was in the PDR. Uh, I was addicted to alcohol, cocaine, heroin, you name it. Everything. Oh, in there. Yeah, the whole, the whole list. All right. Um, and... Somehow, during that drug adult time, I managed to pick up a master's degree in psychology. And uh, eventually, somewhere like, I guess, in the late 70s, early 80s, I left that behind. I'll leave the story out, but, you know, the transformation and you give it up and it's a different thing. And around 82, I got a little bit clearer. And I was, I was touring with a uh, musical theater company. I was doing, I did a lot of road companies, like Broadway shows would go on national tours or they'd go on what we called bus and truck tours, which were kind of a little lower, lower level tour in some of the smaller cities. But we would, I would do a lot of those. And we were sitting down in some city and, you know, I worked with actors and their job was to look great. And their job was to stay in shape. And there were a lot of actors and we had a house, it was, I think, good see opera house in Connecticut where we were staying. And I said to one of them, I said, I was just out of boredom, you know, in between cigarettes. I was, what is this weightlifting stuff you're doing? Teach me one of these exercises. That's how it started. No shit. <laughs> Teach me one of these exercises turned into, holy shit, this is what I was born to do. And I started, at, within a year, I knew where every gym was in every city. We would check into Dallas, Texas. I would go to Doug's gym. That was the place. I mean, this is way before, this before the internet. There were no, there was no Whole Foods. There were health food stores. And people yeah. who went to health food stores were known as health nuts. Right. Health nuts. Right, right, <laughs> right. I and um, I just got bitten by the bug. And I was not one of these guys who had an epiphany, found Jesus, and it all changed. I was the guy that went to the gym, did a set of bench press, go outside and have a cigarette on the break. So <laughs> it was a process. It was a process. But I lost weight. I was a, I was a fat kid. Um, I stopped smoking. Um, I got, a, I, I have a slide where I, where I show myself, you know, one or two years into sobriety, and I look like a fat old man. And then I showed myself speaking at the Dave Asprey Bulletproof Conference in 2018. And I literally, I mean, you can see it. I look 20 years younger. I, I can't even believe, wow. you know, the difference. And that's like 20 years later. Um, so it took me that time. And during the time that I was 
throwing myself into this. Uh, being a, 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 a middle-class Jewish kid from New York who was academically oriented and whose parents, you know, didn't think that you were a full human being without a PhD. Um, the first thing I thought about was, I love this field. Is there a way to get a degree in it? And I found out that you could, if not get a degree in it, you could get certified. You could become a certified personal trainer. And I thought, well, that's, first of all, the way I thought about it was not only would it be fun, but it would look so good on the playbill. The playbill is the thing that they give you in Broadway shows, and there's a little thing about the conductor, and, you know, and I'd have a bio, and I thought, hey, he's also a personal trainer. That would sound so cool. So I go, and I, I pick up a, a fairly easy-to-get certification, AFA, uh, Aerobics and Fitness Association of America. And I fall in love even more. And I go, I got to get another one. And anyway, I picked up six. I got six <laughs> certifications as a personal trainer, including the hard ones. Um, the CSCS, the Conditioning Strength and, and um, the Specialist, the uh, NASM, National Association of Sports Medicine, ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine. I got them all, six. And I had never trained a client. <laughs> I'm in Manhattan, which is where I live, 1991, and I'm walking down Amsterdam Avenue, and I see a new gym is opening, and they got this big sign, and it looks so cool. It's because Equinox coming soon, oh, September 1991. Yeah. Hiring now. This is the first Equinox. Everybody knows what Equinox is now. It's the biggest gym in the country. Um, but this was the first one. Small, uh, an Italian family, the Ericos, they opened it and they were hiring and I walk in, just try it out. And I really will, to this day, never understand why I connected with these people, but they liked me and they hired me. And I started my career as a personal trainer the day that Equinox opened on the floor in the first Equinox in Manhattan. And I was there for seven years. And I ultimately became the dean of the Equinox Fitness Training Institute, which is basically the model for how they train trainers everywhere now. Holy and shit. I was 100,000% in on low fat diets. I believed every piece of information we had been taught. And all of our, at that time, all trainers got whatever nutrition information they got from the American Dietetic Association, which I've said many times publicly was next to the American Diabetes Association, probably <laughs> the most destructive organization for I was waiting for that. Yeah. Next to, next to um, uh, Jane Brody of the New York Times. But don't get me started. <laughs> so I believed in low-fat diets. I was the guy that if you ordered a egg white omelet, as we did in those days, the dumbest nutritional experiment of the last 100 years, when I would order the egg white omelet, it would come back with a little bit of yolk. I would send it back because I knew that I would get a heart attack if I touched that cholesterol. <laughs> That's who I was. And we all were that. All of us. This is 1991. We're coming off of Stop the Insanity, Susan Powder, and the infomercials with the low fat, right? Right, right. And what happened was, remember, we had no nutrition information other than, you know, what they teach you in, in personal training school, which is nothing. Um, so we all believed this. And it was 1991, 92. 92, the Atkins diet came out in its final edition. It, it was originally published in 72. There was another edition. The third edition, final edition before he died was 1992. And the Atkins diet was getting a lot of publicity. And we would have clients who would come in and they'd say, you know, Johnny or Chris or whoever the trainer was, this is just not working for me. I'm doing all this cardio. I'm on this thing. It's joyless and I'm not losing any weight. And I, I you know, I have a golf buddy who lost 30 pounds on Atkins. Right? My hairdresser lost 20 pounds. And I'm going to try this Atkins diet. And we would be horrified. I remember at one point trying to join a movement to get Atkins medical license revoked. I said, you can't do this. You might lose a couple of pounds, but you will die. What are you talking about? You can't go with this crazy pork rinds guy that 
<laughs> but they didn't listen to us. Can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> and I remember one guy in particular who had been yeah, he really resistant to losing weight. I mean, just nothing worked. And the guy comes back and, you know, he's clearly like 20 pounds lighter and his eyes are shy, you know, bright and they, you know, how people look when they when they are healthier. I mean, I'm no medical intuitive, but you can kind of spot when the clearness in the eyes and the energy and the whole thing. And the guy was looking great. And he's telling me that he's going to his doctor and the doctor's like, Mr. What are you doing? He said, your triglycerides have dropped and your blood pressure is lower and your waist size is lower. What are you doing? And he said, well, I tried the Atkins doctor, uh, diet doctor. And he said, you can't do that, I'm gonna kill you. So that's where we were then, right? I mean, and um, there's a, I told you, I, I had a master's in psychology and there is a concept in psychology. You gentlemen probably know what it is. Maybe the audience doesn't. It's called cognitive dissonance. And it means basically that when there are two ideas that are utterly contradictory, you cannot hold them both in your psychic space. You have to resolve the fact that, you know, this kid was the nicest kid that we ever met in the neighborhood. Oh, he went on top of the book depository and just, you know, shot 20 people. Those two things don't go together. So you have to kind of figure out how to make them congruent. So we had here a case of cognitive dissonance. A, the Atkins diet will kill you. B, this guy is standing in front of me and he looks damn good. One of those two things isn't true. Right. right. So I wanted to resolve this cognitive dissonance. I started to think about it and I, I had... I ventured into research. We didn't know how to look up research on PubMed then, but I look up some studies and I see, oh, serum biomarkers are all improving on the ketogenic diet. Wait a minute, what does that even mean? And I'm looking at some of this and it's not really adding up. And I began to think, why have we told these people all our lives to avoid animal products? Why have we told them to avoid saturated fat? Well, the reason is because it raises cholesterol. Well, what if cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease? This guy is eating a lot of fat and he's not dying. What if we were wrong? Then the dietary recommendations collapse like a house of cards. And once I started to realize that, I started to speak out a little about it and ask some questions about it. And all of a sudden, I was a very popular teacher at conferences. I taught trainers all the time. I was, like I said, the dean of the Equinox Fitness Training Institute. And I worked under Bob Esquire. And we taught anatomy and kinesiology and all. No one ever criticized him as a teacher. No one ever said, he's, a, he's, you know, he's not even a doctor. You know, they loved my teaching until I questioned the orthodoxy. Then it was like, who is this guy? He's not even a doc. He's not even a nutritionist. He's a damn personal trainer from Equinox. What does he know? And like, there have been people in the past who've done this who said, okay. And they go back to school and they get the credentials so they can then say the same thing that they were saying before, except now you can't ignore them. The best case I know of that is Richard Bernstein, who wrote the diabetes doctor uh, diet. He's a brilliant a dietitian, a diabetes specialist, and and you know proselytized for all these wonderful things that you and I now know are true and do. But he was an engineer, and nobody took him seriously. When he would ask his doctors why they're putting him on this and why they're doing this and it's not working, and they said, "Well, you don't know anything. You're an engineer." So he got his medical degree, and then he said, <laughs> then he was able to say, "You know what?" So. That's kind of what my model was. So I went back and I got, first I got what was called a CN at the time, Certified Nutritionist. It was one year, of course, wasn't really worth anything, but I got that and then I realized that wasn't enough and I went and got a PhD in what was then called holistic nutrition and would now be called functional nutrition or functional medicine nutrition or integrative nutrition. And then I got board certified. I went to, took about a year uh, the American College of Nutrition had something called the Certifying Board of Nutrition Specialists, and it was a, possibly the most difficult exam I've ever taken in my life, two days long. Um, and I got board certified, and then I was able to tell everybody what I was suspecting was true before I had the degree, which is that you guys are full of it. <laughs> All right, I, I, I got I've kind of been doing that now since uh, then, and it, that's the story. <laughs> you, know, you know, Jay, I got to interject on something because I've listened to your energy and not only your, your sharp brain, but now I want to inspire people. I'm, I'm doing the math in my head of 
all right, musician. Da, da. How old are you? 77. All right, people out there, 77 yeah, years and- old. And this kid, this kid <laughs> is fucking rocking it with knowledge and energy. energy. So if you all are in your 50s and 60s and think life's over, uh, uh, this is going to set the stage for the rest of the stuff because we're going to ask you some very relevant thought processes, Anything which like. which is going to tell you how sharp his brain is, and he's already surpassed that. me. Well, you've already surpassed me, which isn't that hard to do. So, yeah. <laughs> right. I got to ask you something that's becoming really popular, and that is genetic testing, and it's been starting to come around in just the last few years and it's growing traction and the testing can help you understand the unique relationship with our food at a cellular level. And it, where it's it one used of, to be one of the things. Yeah. Not, it used to be you, if your blood type now that you're, they're doing some now you're right. It's not the Holy grail, but is another tool that can be used. And we're seeing it used for food sensitivity and biomarkers. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I th- I've been, I've had uh, three genetic tests. I think genetic testing is is a very promising and important portal. But like many things, I think the marketing is uh, way ahead of what we actually know and can use. I mean, I've seen these things ordered. They they look at thirty genes and they tell you what the ideal diet is. I I think that's kind of nonsense. But um, it. They genetic testing can give you very inf- great information. I'm, I, as I said, I think that they're selling it, uh, overselling it, and before it's really ready for prime time in terms of really like formulating a diet and stuff like that. But I'll give you an example of where genetic testing really can be helpful. There's a gene, and God darn it, it I think it's a PK21 that will tell you how. Um, if you have this gene, you are more disposed to have an inflammatory reaction to inflammatory substances. So these are, it's, it's sort of like this Teflon, Teflon um, pan, and you can have one where the Teflon pan is really, the Teflon is really solid, like an, or there can be some scratches in it, or it could be just about ripped off. And that, that gene tells you which of those is true. Now, by itself, it doesn't mean anything, but if you smoke or if you have a lot of sugar, if you consume a lot of inflammatory substances, you are more likely to suffer, the, you know, to see your CRP go up and to see other inflammatory markers go up. So you might want to be a particularly cautious about consuming things that are inflammatory. That would be one example of where that could be really useful. Um, I don't know. I haven't really seen diets designed around that kind of testing. I know that there are uh, clinicians that I respect a lot, Bryce Wild in Canada, who does extensive genetic testing, and it it really helps him cater stuff to his patients. But I'm I I've always been suspicious of the one size fits all. When Damato came out with the blood type diet, of course I read it. Um, and if you remember, everybody was walking around going, well, I'm type O, so I should be able to eat meat. And that's not at all what the guy said. The people who actually took his course, it was there were four types and about 17 subtypes for each one. And it was a very complicated and involved and personalized thing. It wasn't like, oh, I'm blood type A, I'm a vegetarian. So I think the way this stuff gets marketed is very often... Uh, a real bastardization of the original concept and, and what the original people like D'Amato actually said. Because if you saw his blood type course, it was very, very thorough and difficult. And clinicians went through it. And there was a lot more to it than just, what's your blood type? You're a vegetarian. We would like to thank Guardian Grains for sponsoring the Kraken Backs podcast. These ancient grains are made to keep your gut happy and healthy. Check the description below for a link to their many food products. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm also going to switch gears, kind of staying on that line, because uh, we had a cardiologist that, uh, on the show that I, I know you know, uh, Dr. Jack Wolston. Love him. And, Love both oh, he's, of them. The oh, he's, fan, he's fantastic. And he brought up um, <clears throat> one of oh. your favorite topics, statins. <laughs> yeah. And and so 
And we know there's two types. A lot of people just throw both types into one big group, but there's actually two types of statins. And 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 then that ties into what you alluded to earlier, the, the cholesterol and the myths that go along with that and, and how all these are weaved into a modern thought process. All right. I want to blow apart this modern thought process and do a total paradigm shift and get people thinking differently. So the floor is yours when it comes to the statins and the cholesterol. Well, I don't think that's a place to start when we talk about heart disease, but let's start with it anyway. Um, because the whole idea of statins is based on a premise that I think needs to be examined, which is we're going to lower your cholesterol, Mr. Jones. It's 206. We got to put you on it. But let's just talk about the statins. So statins, Steve and I, Steve Sinatra was the cardiologist with whom I wrote The Great Cholesterol Myth. He was my co-author. He died. Um, Steve would prescribe statins once in a great while. We were never anti-statin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually quote Joe Rogan on this because I have a feeling that you guys won't like roll your eyes. But Joe Rogan said this about vaccines, and I'm going to say the same thing about statins. I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm anti-propaganda. That's what he said. I agree with him. I'm not anti-statin. I'm anti-over-marketing, over-prescription, over-selling, and propaganda. So you had a drug here that showed some promise in a very specific population, which was middle-aged men with previous heart attacks. So it was a drug that was developed for secondary prevention. In other words, Mr. Jones, you had a heart attack. Let's keep you from getting a second one. That's secondary prevention. Primary prevention is you never had a heart attack and let's keep it that way. So they were never tested in the beginning for primary uh, prevention. They were tested for secondary in a very specific population, and they did show some promise for that. The companies did exactly what a toy company would do, an electronics company would do. They did a brand extension. They go, okay, great. We got the middle-aged men with previous heart attack. That's not enough. Let's get the older women. Let's get the 13-year-olds. Let's get 13-year-olds who we can tell their parents, you know what? There's some markers here for heart disease. You don't want little Jimmy to get a heart disease. Let's stop it early on with 13-year-olds on statins. You had you had, uh, God, I can't remember his name, but he he's a very distinguished doctor who I used to really, really admire for a million different reasons. And he went on national television and said, this drug is so great, it should be in the water supply. Mm -hmm. So you had that. Yeah. And you have, you ha I play tennis. I'm a tennis player. So I play every day and I play literally with people in the age range of teenagers to 82 year olds. And I would see the older guys I played with come in with every symptom you can imagine. Muscle pain, memory loss, libido is a thing of the past, and all related to the statins. And I'd say, why are you on a statin? You're 75 years old. And evidence shows absolutely zero effect on 75-year-olds and over. Oh, no, my doctor said, you know, my cholesterol is 206. So... And the reason that, I mean, one of the reasons that people don't really realize the extent of the side effects of statins is because doctors don't report them. And we know that because there's a fantastic study from Stanford by Beatrice Golem, where she literally categorized all of the statin side effects and then looked and found that 65% of doctors don't report them. And you know why they don't report them? Because they don't believe their patients. And you know why? Because they have been successfully marketed to by the statin manufacturers. So what happens is the guys I play tennis with, they go back to their doctor and they say, Doc, I'm forgetting my wife's name since you gave me this crest on this. Don't worry, it's just a mild cognitive impairment. It has nothing to do with the statin. Or I'm starting to get these joint pains that I never had before when, I, when you put me on Lipitor. Oh, no, 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 it's not that. It's just mild arthritis. It's what's, what's to be expected. So they don't believe it. It's not that they're being vicious. They don't believe it. They have been successfully marketed to by the companies that make them, and they don't think these side effects are... They think their patients are wrong. So you got 65% of doctors not reporting the side effects. Now, you and I would take an experimental drug with a long list of potential side effects if we thought it would save our lives. If you and I had, God forbid, some 
very, very obscure kind of cancer. And they said, look, we got this experimental drug. It does all these things. We're not sure, but it's the only thing that's going to sign me up. But that's not the case with statins. There are so many people on statins who are not benefiting from them at all that they're not even in the populations you would expect to benefit from them. And they have shown almost no benefits in studies. Like you, Sometimes what you'll do is you'll get a study in which the statin group, there are two less heart attacks in the statin group, but what they don't report or what they bury somewhere in the results is that there are also two more deaths from something else like cancer or diabetes. So as John Abramson from Harvard said once, is it a successful drug if you die from a different disease? No, it really isn't. So there's a, there's a lot that's wrong with the marketing of statins. Now, what do they do? Is there any good side to them? Yes, they thin the blood slightly. As Steve used to say, they make the blood a little less like ketchup and a little more like red wine. They're mildly anti-inflammatory. And since we have an epidemic of inflammation everywhere in the world, any, we can use all the help we can. I believe you can lower inflammation with fish oil and vitamin E and ginkgo way better than you can with a statin. But OK, that's all they got. It's a little bit of an anti-inflammatory. It's a blood thinner. It's a, a little bit helps prevent platelet aggregation. Good. It does those things. Uh, there are people in, on my, in my neck of the woods on this issue who think that statins would be an even better drug if they didn't lower cholesterol and they just did the other stuff. Um, so that they're not useless. And, and it's only because we're such a, a segmented society with such tribalism on every side that we got, you're either anti-statin or you're pro-statin. There's no gray, there's no nuance. And we are like, yeah, use them if they're appropriate. But this insane idea that you use our current, and that's why I said statins isn't the place to start, because we use an outdated cholesterol test in order to get the data to prescribe them. I think anyone who's taking a statin based on that four, on, on triglycerides, HDL, LDL, and glucose is practicing, is, is, it's medical malpractice. It's an idiotic way to prescribe a drug. That's like prescribing a treatment plan based on if you're short or tall. It's 1963 medicine. We now know there's 13 different subtypes of LDL. You're really going to do good and bad? I mean, it's, it, it, first of all, there is no good and bad cholesterol. Let's start with that. If you look under the microscope at cholesterol, it is exactly the same molecule, whether it is in an LDL or an HDL. It's not good or bad. It's like I'm, I, the example I use is I'm a passenger. I'm in an airport. If I get on a plane to Philly or if I get on a plane to Hawaii, I'm the same Johnny Bowden. I'm just on a different plane. So cholesterol is cholesterol, whether it's an HDL or an LDL. And that really brings us to what we should be looking at in cholesterol tests, which is the L in LDL or HDL, the lipoprotein. Cholesterol doesn't by itself get caught in the artery walls. Lipoproteins do. Lipoproteins get damaged. If you are running a marina and you want to prevent boat accidents, what do you want to know? You don't want to know what's in the glove compartment of the boat. You want to know how many boats are in the water. That's what causes accidents. The more boats, the more likelihood of crash. Cholesterol is the cargo. It sits in the boat. It's the boat that we should be looking at. And guess what? We have tests that we've had for over a decade, possibly longer, that will tell you precisely that, and doctors don't prescribe them. Why? Because insurance companies don't cover them. So you have the NMR particle test, you have the uh, cardiac IQ, you have the LPIR test, Quest Labs gives them, uh, uh, um, what's the other one, uh, LabCorp gives them, they are widely available everywhere. But insurance companies generally don't cover them, and so doctors don't prescribe them. And they're prescribing based on good and bad cholesterol, which is fucking insane. And I'll give you a personal example. I've had perfect LDL, HDL, you know, total cholesterol all my adult life, 175, I mean, under, two, well under 200, good LDL numbers. Whatever year it was that I discovered that that was a, a, an, an antiquated test and I got the real test, my risk factors were much higher. It was all obscured by LDL and, and HDL. But when you looked at my, what they call particle numbers, which is how many LDLs, it was in the red. 
when you looked at what type of particles, are they big or are they small? That's another dimension that is not looked at at the cholesterol test. The, the big fluffy molecules, the LDLs that are big and fluffy, they don't do any, they're cardiovascularly neutral. They're not good, they're not bad, they do no harm. The little small athogenic ones, those are the bad guys. They're inflamed, they're oxidized, they get caught in the endothelial wall, they start this process of black pool. They're the bad guys. You don't know that from LDL. You will only know it from a, a more granular test that looks at the size. So what we what when you have mainly big fluffy ones, they call it pattern A, and that is fairly benign. When you have nasty little dark, you know, um, inflamed molecules of, of LDL, that's called pattern B. I had pattern B. That's not seen in the HDL LDL test. So you know, number one with a bullet is stop testing in this old fashioned way. What were the first three, what were the three tests that you suggested that aren't typically or traditionally ordered? That, I, did, I, I couldn't hear the first one. Well, the, the size of the particles, I think the size of the particles is important. And I think the number of particles is important. Now, there are doctors I respect, such as Peter Atia who stopped using that advanced test because of two reasons. One, they felt there were inconsistent results. Two, they just gave up on getting doctors to prescribe it. So they use as a surrogate for that the ApoB number, which is a, a decent surrogate. I mean, it tell, there's an ApoB protein that wraps around every LDL, VLDL, all of the ones that have a tendency to become bad or, or become problematic. And by knowing your ApoB number, you kind of have an idea of how many lipoproteins are in the water. So it's, a, it's, it's okay. Um, but we've, we've got to go beyond good and bad cholesterol testing. It's just idiotic. It, it's so in the past. And, and yet we use it because it's a $31, $31 billion a year business. They're not changing it. Brilliant. Wow. That was fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, let me uh, ask you about diets then. Let me ask you about strategies for, let's say, 50 and 60-year-olds, uh, what, what would you suggest as far as just an orientation of the types of diets that you do like? So I've written a lot about diets. I've met my Not my first, but one, one of my early books was called um, Living Low Carb, and it was literally an analysis of 38 different diets that existed at the time I wrote it. Now that book's now in its fourth edition and we a lot of those diets don't even exist anymore. So we've really streamlined it down to categories of diets like ketogenic versus paleo versus, you know, as opposed to the Goldberg diet and the this diet and the South Beach diet and the Atkins diet, just into categories. But this is what I this is the dietary advice that I give on every podcast because I'm always asked that. What's the best diet? So the first thing I say is that there is no best diet. There is no best diet. There is a best fit between diet and person. And that takes a little bit of investigation. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. But people have thrived on almost every kind of diet you can imagine. I am very, very far from a vegan, but I am not going to deny the evidence of my senses that there's a guy named Joel Furman. He's like your age, he's maybe early 60s, late 50s. He looks amazing. He's an advocate for vegan diets. God bless him. It's rare, but it happens. It, it, there are people who do well on it. Um, the point is that there are people who have survived on diets very, very diverse in nature. What they have not survived on, what there is no culture in the world who has survived on a high sugar, high processed food diet. So my advice on diet is really, I, first of all, at 77, my mission now is to simplify things for people. People are swimming in contradictory information and a lot of BS, and they're confused beyond belief. I see that in my private practice. I see that in my talks and Facebook lives everywhere, just complete confusion. So I want to bring it back to basics. This is the best dietary advice you will ever, ever get, ladies and gentlemen. And if you follow this, you can forget everything else. Eat real food. Now let's define what we mean by real food. It's not kale chips. It's kale. It's food that if you showed it, to your great, 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 great grandmother, she'd know exactly what to do with it. When they showed supermarket food to the Blue Zones people, they literally said, 
what is this? What what do you do with it? Juice in a box, TV dinner, <laughs> frozen. I don't understand this. Okay. So real food is food that would spoil if you left it outdoors, right? It, a Twinkie will be there in 2,000 years. A hamburger will spoil, in a, you know, in a few hours. Um, that's real food. Now, if you start with that, the rest is all details. Now you can play with the macronutrient distribution, but real food, and in fact, Jeffrey Bland, who is a guru to just about everybody who has an internet presence in the health food world, in the, in the health world, I and mean, we all studied with Jeffrey Bland, said real food trump, trumps everything. Trump's diet, macronutrient distribution, you know, vegan carnivore, whatever. I mean, because you, you can eat a vegan junk food and you can eat carnivore junk food. So it's really about are you eating real, actual food? And I used to I used to narcissistically call it the Johnny Bowden Four Food Groups. Food you could have, hunted, fished, gathered, or caught. Period. You don't have to go out and hunt it and fish it, but if it was huntable, fishable pluckable off a tree or gatherable off the ground, it's probably good for you. And the rest of it, you can play with. I, I used to have a, a saying at the office, if God made it, you can eat it. If man made it, I would be nervous. Yeah, I think that's a that, it, that's clever, and, and but it's a, probably a little of, a, of an overgeneralization. I mean, even like processed, we say processed food is so bad. There are methods of processing that are minimal and perfectly healthy. There's a company that makes venison in Hawaii, and they they make venison sticks. You know, so they have to they, they have to be processed and dried, and a little bit of salt. It's very minor, but that's processed food. I mean, my my whey protein drink is processed food. I mean, it, there are processing methods that that are are benign. You know, fermentation is processing in a way, or it's not processing, but it's allowing something to happen to the food. But that's a big difference in Pringles. That, that's another category than, you know what I'm saying? Than, than right, Taco right. Bell. <laughs> right. And, that, and that's fair. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. How do you feel about, how do you feel about fasting? Oh, yeah, there you go. I'm a bit, I totally, I've taught a course in it. We did, my partner and I designed a course called Metafasting that we taught for about a year. Um, I, I think it is, I don't even think of it as fasting anymore. It's just the way I eat. I mean, I don't eat in the morning. I play tennis every morning, six days a week, two hours a day. And I do it on empty on black coffee or an empty stomach, coffee and cream. And I don't eat my first meal sometimes even later than I... Usually it's 12, 1 o'clock, but, but sometimes it's even as late as 4. So I, I kind of am in a fasted state a lot of the time. So more intermittent fasting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I I've never been able to do like the the big spiritual fast three days, two days. You know, lots of autophagy, all that good stuff. But but I think you get a benefit from less food, and I think that there are lessons from the intermittent fasting community that everybody can use. That that really stand up to the research and and pass the smell test and been clinically observed to be very beneficial. And those are very very simple things. Don't eat between meals. I mean, that really does matter. You've got to give your, we didn't talk about this yet, but my biggest passion is getting people to understand insulin resistance, which is the metabolic plague of the 21st century. But the point is it allows fasting, allows insulin levels to get back down to normal, blood glucose levels to get back down to normal. It's kind of like, I think if my email box is just crowded like this. It's a way of saying, I'm turning off the computer while I answer the email that's in the box so that I can just clean that out before the new batch comes in. And that's kind of what intermittent fasting does. If you're eating all day long, your insulin never goes down. And insulin is a fat storage hormone. So, yes, I think that one lesson is don't eat between meals. The second lesson is let four hours go between meals. That's the ideal time. And the third lesson is don't eat a couple of hours before, de before bed. If you could do those three things, I don't care if you're intermittent fasting or not, but that is, you know, even if you're eating three meals a day. But let four hours go between meals and let two hours go before bed. I, I remember years ago, there was a conversation about that grazing was a favorable approach 
you know, and then then fasting was. Yeah, I taught that. God, I, I, I mea culpa. I taught that crap. We all <laughs> did in Equinox. It's great for the food companies. Yeah, let's mini meals and grazing. It's a horrible way to eat. It guarantees your insulin levels will always be up. It guarantees that there'll be a snack industry because everyone, you know, mini meals. First of all, Americans don't know what a mini meal is. That that just does not process in our in our brains. So everybody was eating six meals a day, not mini meals. Of two, you know. And those 100-calorie snack things that they sell, I mean, that's all based on the theory that calories are all that matter. So if you just give them to 100 calories, you can eat whatever you want. And it's, it's, it's just, uh, grazing's a terrible idea. Like right, low-fat, I... it was just one of the, one of the really bad ideas. <laughs> Nutrition. All right, John, I have a question on that because you just hit on something. Um, you, you have these teenage kids all the way up to maybe even 30. And all they talk about is I want to gain weight. They want, especially the boys that, that 18 to 24, I want to gain weight. I want to bulk up. I want to get, so they just calories, calories, calories. And they're constantly eating. I have, Spencer has two boys. I have two boys. They're constantly eating. And, and it was interesting. My son lived in Portugal and he goes, I wasn't that hungry when I was in Portugal here. I'm all, I eat and like an hour later, I'm starving again. So can you talk a little bit about not only the American food and why he was hungry here and he's not hungry in, in Europe, but the other thing I want to address these kids, I even know a kid that takes, goes to this, goes to uh, a sandwich shop and then gets Doritos and shoves it with Doritos. Cause he goes, it adds more calories to the sandwich. You know, can you talk a little bit about how we can change this mindset for these kids who one, maybe think they know it all. And two, um, are misinformation. Really, really? You're asking me, I mean, <laughs> seriously, that's way out of my pay scale. Dude. <laughs> How do we change the American mindset? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's doing something hard. <laughs> you know, I, I'm giving you an arrow. I'm trying to shoot it, right? <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, I think that the, the good news, if there is any good news in that, is that they grow out of that. You know, they, their their bodies at 18 and 19 and 20 can survive a lot of. I mean, I survived heroin addiction. Like, you know, you can you can you can survive a lot of that. And there is some truth to the fact that if you're trying to bulk up, you need to eat more food. You know, they they're not thinking in terms of what are the metabolic effects of this food, or what are the hormonal effects of food, or which ones will be most likely to help you build muscle, which is protein. They're just thinking about more food and and more calories. And, um, you know, hopefully, if we can educate people about nutrition and the metabolic effect of food and the hormonal effect of food, we can make better choices. We, we have a very close friend who's a, um, a dancer and a bodybuilder. He's constant. I mean, the whey protein, because he can't keep weight on. And, and, you know, in order to put on any muscle, he just has to eat thousands of calories a day. I know he has a little... A lot of sympathy <laughs> from older people. Oh, it's really, that's a hard life you got there trying to eat more calories to gain weight. Um, obviously, this is not our demographic that we see as clients. Those people are trying to do the opposite. But right. it's really based on the same, I, and a lot of those people are trying to do it with the same cockamamie notions. If I just eat less calories, I'll be fine. And that's just not true. It's, you know, the, one of the first lessons I learned at Equinox, as a trainer, was at the feet of Barry Sears, who wrote the Zone books, the MIT um, um, scientist that, that wrote the Zone and that whole series of books. And food has a hormonal effect. Calories have a hormonal effect. You've got to look at what the, what the hormones that are being um, stimulated by the food are doing. So you eat a, a thousand calories of starch is Cheerios, your insulin's going to go up to here, you eat a thousand calories of steak, not so much, and a thousand calories of fat, it's not even going to move the needle. So you got to look at the hormonal effect of these things. Hmm. And kids are not doing that, obviously. No. And what about the processes when they're in Europe, they eat and they're, and they're satisfied, they hear they eat and the same food and they're not satisfied? Well, there's a couple things about that. First of all, um, we have a lot of social cues for constant eating and snacking. There's 7-Elevens and there's snack shops and people walk in the street and they eat in the car. And there's a lot of 
advertisements and cues and social support for eating all kinds of foods all day long, which I have not observed as much in overseas. Second of all, food, rice isn't always rice and wheat isn't always wheat and they're not one monolithic thing. They always say, well, the, the Chinese and Japanese eat a lot of rice. I've been to both China and, and Japan and let me tell you how much rice they eat. An ice cream scooper full. A tiny little ball of rice in the middle of a plate of seafood and miso soup and and salmon. So yeah, they eat rice, but they don't sit there and eat New York takeout Chinese food, you know, quarts at a time. And even the wheat, if you read, read the wonderful book, Wheat Belly, by uh, William Davis, the cardiologist, he talks about how the different types of wheat you know, dwarf wheat, the kind of wheat we have here, they, these things, they're not all the same. You can't really just say, well, they eat that there and we eat that here and how come it's a problem? Because we, we eat a very different version very often of these things. And, you know, they've been, they've been genetically altered to be sweeter and, and, you know, to grow faster and whatever else they do with that stuff. And that isn't always the case in Europe. So they're eating a lot more traditional foods. They may both be called rice or they both be called, but it's not quite the same thing. You know, if they eat pasta in Italy that's handmade. They don't eat ranzoni out of the can. So yeah, they're both pastas, but I don't think that they both send the same information to the body. Perfect. Question. Okay. And there's a lot more fiber in those, which may be another reason why your son is more full in Portugal than he is in the fiberless wasteland of fast food in America, you know? Yeah. 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 You started to touch off on, we touched off on a lot of diets actually, but how much does ancestry dictate what you should be eating? You know, where you came from? Your... Well, I think it makes a difference. I mean, you know, in, in, there are entire swaths of, I think it makes a difference, your ancestry, in the sense that there are swaths of the population that are lactose intolerant. There's some that are less so and some that are completely, um, yeah, I think I think some of that matters, but I, I do think that the individual kind of trumps the, the... You were talking about genes earlier and gene testing. I have a slide that says, I didn't make this up, but I use it because it's brilliant. And it's genes loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Ooh. So for example... Let's say I have a gene. I don't even know if such a gene exists, but the gene says that if this guy's lungs are exposed to cigarette smoke, he's almost certain to get lung cancer because not everybody does. There are outliers who smoke a pack a day and die without lung cancer. You know, I mean, it happens, right? So let's say I have the lung cancer gene. It's like a light switch, dude. If I don't smoke, who cares? It's that gene says that I will, I will be very susceptible to the bad results of cigarette smoke because my lungs are weaker or like we talked about that inflammation gene in the arteries, right? But if I don't do the thing, if I don't turn the light switch on, it's wired to go on the ceiling, but I'm just not going to turn on the switch. So we have a, it, I, I don't think genes are destiny. There are monogenetic diseases, like you get one gene, if you, luck of the draw, you got this gene, sorry, dude, there's nothing we can do. Cystic fibrosis is one, Huntington's chl chlorea is another. That's about the list I can name. I mean, it's very, very few. Mo gene, diabetes doesn't have one gene. There may be 50 genes that will predispose you, and it's all an algorithm. If this happens, that more is more likely to happen. And it's not just you got the gene, you got the disease. So... You know, we get the genetic card we are dealt, we can't do anything about, but I'm all about taking the cards you have and playing the best hand. Hmm. Good. Love that. A quick little question about quercetin. The quercetin is a, uh, a flavonoid that the main sources are onion and um, apples. And uh, it is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. And I am very, very enamored of it. And it is in my daily routine and has been for years. I'm during the pandemic when everybody was asking, what should we take? What should we, it was on my list of top seven things to, to take as a, as a anti-inflammatory. Very good. Very good. Perfect. Johnny, we're going to start wrapping up, but 
But I, thank you, thank you. We're going to start wrapping up, but I want to ask you five rapid-fire questions that we typically ask of our guests. Then we are going to. I ha, I have a feeling you're going to do real well with these questions, and they're they're some of them are erroneous, but uh, you know I'm sure you'll come up with a quick answer for each one. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready, man. Okay, let's hear. Question number one. When you were a personal trainer, what was the most awkward experience you had with a client? Honestly, when you say when when you ask that, I can't think of one. Oh. I didn't really have awkward experiences. Well, okay. Um, All right. I've had Difficult clients. I've had clients whose purpose was to prove that I couldn't help them. They, we call them uncoachable. But I've never really had an awkward or embarrassing moment with a client. I was pretty, I had pretty good relationships with clients. And I didn't really have any, any I, I, I'm not avoiding the question. Believe me, I no, can't no, no. think great. of one. All right. All right. I'm going on to question number two. Are you ready? What? Is yeah. your personal food weakness? Ice cream. <laughs> he didn't even hesitate. That was great. That was good. Ice cream and, and yeah. possibly Tate's chocolate chip cookies. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Question number three. Regarding pit bulls and parrots, how do these two completely different animals have significance in your life? Well, I, I'm going to have to give you a visual aid for this. You're going to give me one second. Ready? <laughs> oh, yeah, this, here is they a, come. this is a sign that hangs up in my kitchen. That's great. That's great. I don't know if it's, reverse, yeah. if it's reversing. It says, it's not a home without a pit bull. <laughs> That's how our house is. That's awesome. And we don't have parrots, but we love them. We follow them on Instagram. Hamlet is one of our favorites. And we don't have them because, A, we don't think they'll get along with the dogs, and, B, because they live like 80 years and they'll survive, you know, outlive us, and we don't want to deal, you know, like that. Right on, right but on. But love parrots, love pit bulls. have had pit bulls for 30 years. We have two of them. Dog so why, why the pit bull as a breed? I think I am generally drawn to misunderstood phenomena. I, I, they are a very misunderstood breed. There are many things in life that are misunderstood. Robert F. Kennedy being one of them. <laughs> um, and, and I've, I've always been kind of attracted, of attracted to, to, wait a minute, this, this isn't exactly, exactly what, what you're, you're saying, saying about it. it. And my wife and I just, we love the faces. We, we, we look, I get, there was a movie, a Brad Pitt movie, a, a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And he had a central casting pit bull in this movie. It was like the most frightening pit bull you had ever seen. It had the ears were clipped. It had the big thing. And there was a scene where they're in his house and the camera rolls and you see this pit bull and the whole audience gasps. And my wife and I go, oh. <laughs> That's we just, awesome. we love the face. We love that, you know, they're very, if, if they are raised right, they are the sweetest dogs in the world. You just have to know what you're doing with them. You don't leave them alone and chain to the backyard. And, and then people do all these awful things. They're very people oriented and they need their people and they need socialization. And once they are, I would trust ours with, we have one of our pit bulls loves babies and tries to kiss every baby in the restaurants and in the street. Um, so not all, but properly raised, they're just wonderful dogs and they're funny looking. So I don't know. We like, we like them with their little funny faces. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Question. That was great. <laughs> question number four. What do you feel as far as physical challenges that everyone over 50 should attempt? I don't think there's anything that 
everyone over any age should. I, I'm very, I'm not a big fan of the shoulds. I think that there are some basic stretches that people over 50 should do on a regular basis that are very, very good. <laughs> yeah. to, it's a general thing. Um, two or three, you know, basic full body stretches. Um, I think it's very important. I think one of the things we've learned in the last 10 years or so is how underappreciated muscle is as an organ of longevity. And there are people like Gabriella Lyons, whose who's podcast is really all about muscle is the, in, is the organ of longevity. How do we preserve that? Peter Atia talks about it in Outlive. How do we preserve it? How do we build it? And, and I think that probably the take home lesson from that is that we are not consuming enough protein and that the government recommendations, what a surprise, have been wrong and, and really way underestimating how much protein we really need for optimal well being. So I would say, you know, some form of muscle maintenance is, is pretty important for people over 50. Very good. Got it. Very good. Yeah. Question number five, last one, Johnny. And what is your go to book that you read and you could read over and over again? Oh, wow. <laughs> We're talking about nonfiction or fiction? Any book. Oh, open. Fair game. Oh man, I, I, that's a very hard question. Um, there is there are a couple of novels that I've read multiple times um, that always delight. And in terms of nonfiction, I come back a lot to the Moral Animal, which is a really good book about evolutionary psychology, and. I haven't read Outlive twice. I've only read it once, but I have a feeling I will go back to that book and read it again. Um, I think it's the best book ever written on anti-aging. Outlive, and okay. I'd have to do. I'd have to think. Outlive by Peter Atia. Yep, good book. Um, yeah, I did a a big library. Uh, every few years, I have to like clean out the thousands of books, that, you know, and, and th those are some of the books that have survived. They survived time and time again when I, you know, when I clean out the library. And but uh, yeah, I, that's a great question. And it's the only one that ever stumped me. <laughs> I never. <laughs> Which one I would go back to. <laughs> I mean, the one uh, I read the Daily Stoic every day. That's probably a book I'll read over and over and over and over again. I, I use it as a daily, the Daily Stoic, um, Ryan Holiday. And it's a book of daily meditations from Stoic philosophy. And, and you can read, you know, one, one per day, January 1st to December 31st. And I've been using it for five years. So I guess I guess that's actually the book that I would come back to. And Seneca's book, How to Die. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. All right. Which is really, which is really how to live. Right, right. right. Yeah. That's a, that, that's a can good can one. I plug, can I plug my practice or my website or my books at least? Oh, we're, we're getting there. Okay, um, yes, of course, we, of course you can. I want to fit. First off, thank you. We're going to finish oh, off. My pleasure. Um, what, a, what a joy this was. Uh, oh, and... and I'm like writing notes down and all that kind of stuff. So, and the fact that that we're in the same neighborhood, we're gonna be. I'm gonna be calling you. We're gonna be having lunch. But oh yeah, I want, I, I want to finish with this, and then yes, the floor is yours to plug whatever you want. Um, but finding real food, farm to table, is not easy as it sounds. I it want is you to you live. <laughs> That's true. You Very can't. true. <laughs> but for some people, like in the Midwest or in the cities and all that, they struggle deserts. with that there a little bit. Deserts, yeah. um, so you, can you just give some final advice for the people that struggle with that and then weave it into what you're doing now in your books? Well, I mean, there's always a trade-off between co convenience and quality. I mean, that's true. I used to be a, a stereo 
equipment fanatic user. And it was true then. I mean, you get all of them in one box. It's not as good as when you have separate preamplifier, amplifier. You know, so every time you have a certain amount of convenience, you're sort of sacrificing. Um, and if you live in a food desert, that I mean, that again is beyond my pay scale. How do we fix that? I, I, I don't really know. But you try to eat the stuff that doesn't come in boxes as much as possible. You try to read the ingredients, and if there's a lot of ingredients you can't pronounce, try to move on to stuff you can understand. It's like Warren Buffett says about investing. If I don't understand what a company does, I don't invest in it. If you can't understand what's in the food, don't eat it. If, it, if it's got 8 million chemical names, it's probably not good for you. Um, I don't know what other good advice to give to people who live in food deserts. I, I think that's a big political problem and an economic problem and, and, and a demographic problem. And, uh, you know, if all you got is a 7-Eleven beef jerky, I guess. I just, I just, I, I, I am stumped by that. Um, but it's always possible to find better food. Like even in a food desert, there's, it may never get to good, but there's really crappy and just a little crappy and then just you know, kind of okay. Go for the okay, if that's all you can do. Um, and, and people kind of know that. They know that, you know, the Pringles is not is not in the class that you're right. And and to the extent that people can understand that, you know, one of the things when I work when I've worked with addicts is you have to find out what the thing they're looking for is when they're addicted and give them something else that will do it. It's the same thing that they teach you as parents with kids. The kid's screaming out for water every night. He doesn't want water. He wants your parent. He wants attention. So if you find a way to get attention that isn't destructive and doesn't, you know, drive the family crazy, like reading a story, you can get rid of the behavior. Uh, I worked with a guy who was completely addicted to pot. I mean, in the in ways that you wouldn't think you could be addicted to pot. But he's in the ten percent of the population who really, really gets addicted. And it never worked to tell him information about what that was doing to him or any. It, what would work is to find out a way to get the pleasure, or even the escape that he was getting from pot in a different way. So, so many of us get our sensual pleasure from crappy food. Find a better way to get, don't get rid of the pleasure, just find a different way to get it. So I think when we start to realize how much of eating is automatic and it's just for the taste and just for the, you know, boredom and just for all those reasons, and that comes down to self-awareness and that is a difficult thing to teach. But that's kind of the path that I think you got to go on with that. You yeah. kind of understand yeah. what is it that's when I during the pandemic I really saw this because we couldn't go shopping and we couldn't you know and I watched myself on the phone just reaching out. Wait a minute, what am I do? Half this is unconscious. I'm not even hungry, you know. But you got to look at that. I think. Yeah. All right. Tell us what you're up to. Um, my website is johnnybowden.com, J-O-N-N-Y, no H in Johnny. I'm at Johnny Bowden, and I do, uh, at this point, I do private consultations, but I do a very special kind. I don't see people 10 times in a row. I don't look at their food diary. We do strategy sessions. What, what information do you have that maybe isn't serving you? What is stopping you from reaching your goals, whether it starts with nutrition and health, which it always does, or maybe something bigger. I've had sessions where a guy comes in and says, I've, I've just gained 30 pounds since I broke up with my girlfriend. I used to go to the gym and I used to do this. And I go, tell me about the girlfriend. And we spent a half an hour on that. And he told me six months later, it was the greatest life-changing session he had ever had. So I talk about mm -hmm. anything and everything with people. And it's about a one-hour session. And I do those. And you can book them on my website. And I love doing that because the people who come to me have to kind of do an obstacle course to get there. They got to go there. They got to book the website. I'm not cheap. It's all that stuff. But they really want my input on their their situation. And I love working with people like that. So I do those. And of course, um, I do things like this. So if, and my book is The Great Cholesterol Myth. I hope everybody will read it. Uh, and that's that's it for my promos. There you go. And I will put all the links to all that in your description. 
and for the show and make sure everybody knows how to get to you and find you so they don't have to weep so dramatically to find you. So <laughs> thank you so much. This was so fun, guys. I really appreciate the invitation. I was so delighted to do this. Oh, well, great, great have a great you, day and thank you for helping people, man. You're welcome. Bye bye, guys. Oh, don't hate me. <laughs>